I'm Tim Cook with Cooksaw Manufacturing and I want to show you our latest AC36 thin kerf sawmill and uh, I want to show you the details of this sawmill so that you can understand why it makes it such an excellent mill. We've been building the AC36 for 25 years. Uh, just to give you a little of my background, I've been uh, sharpening saw blades for 38 years. My dad was a saw filer, my granddad was a saw filer, so we've got saw filing in our blood. We got sawdust in our blood and we like sawmills. So uh, we, we have studied the intricate things that need to be done on a sawmill to make them saw good, make them saw straight, make them saw fast and build it heavy duty so that it can withstand the logs hammering on the mill. Uh, pick up heavy logs, handle heavy logs, and you'll see that as we go through this mill, how heavy our turner is, how heavy the log loader is, and, uh, and just what makes this mill function so easily. It's easy to maintain, easy to saw straight lumber, and that's what I want to show you as we go through the details. One of the things I like to think about when I, when I look at a sawmill, the very first thing that comes to my mind is, what is the heart of this sawmill? Well, naturally, it's the saw blade. Well, how do we treat this saw blade good is very, very important. So when you look at a sawmill, it's got a band wheel that drives it. It's got a band wheel that idles on the other side to maintain the tension on the blade. We've got the blade on the wheels. The wheels have to be crowned and true. That's very important to us. We want wheels that are absolutely true. We have a wheel grinder that grinds this wheel just like a crankshaft is ground in an automobile engine. And so we put a, the crown just like we want it with this grinding machine so that the band tracks properly. Then once we hold that tension correct, we've got it tensioned properly. We need adjustment on these wheels so that they'll tilt. These, this machine is made so we can get the right tilt adjustment so that that blade can saw at its optimum speed forward. Now you got guides. What kind of guides are you going to put on the saw is the question. We choose roller guides because it is absolutely the best. Now we don't just throw a roller guide on. A lot of technology in these guides. We, uh, we spin that roller guide and true it up so it has zero tolerance after it's heat treated. That's very, very important. We want this guide to be very true. When I look down at this blade and it's sawing across, when you're inspecting the mill to decide what you want to buy, look down while that blade's running. If that thing looks like it's an eighth of an inch thick, it's got a problem. And, and it can be the bam wheel. See, a bam wheel out around is going up and down, up and down. Bam wheel out around is going in and out. So it's going doing both things. It puts a whip in this blade and it shouldn't be a whipping blade. That blade should look like a pencil line running across. And when it looks like a pencil line, those wheels are doing their job, the guides are doing their job. Now, if that guide's out around, it's beating, this guide will spin like 11,000 RPMs. So it will beat that blade and hammer it like a hammer. We have greasable guides. We have the bearing so that we can flush the grease in and it, and it, and it keeps that bearing at its best and cool. That'll give it the best life. When you look at the adjustment system that we have here, we have uh, four adjustment bolts here. Inside of this receiver, there's a square bar that fits in a receiver, and so we can tilt this thing any direction we want. So I can get up or down, side to side, and, uh, and get this guy just like I want it. Then I have adjustment from top to bottom. We want a quarter inch down pressure minimum on this blade. Then I can use my down pressure to adjust and get this blade perfectly parallel with this bunk. When I'm perfectly parallel with that bunk, now I'm gonna be sawing uh, uniform lumber and then my squaring arms, if I, they're squared up properly, I'm gonna saw a square cant. And that's what everybody's after is a good square cant, good square lumber. Here's a real important part of, of the sawmill. This, this blade needs lubrication. It don't need water to cool it, we prevent heat. Lubrication prevents heat. So I want diesel fuel, biodiesel, something with oil in it. You can put, I love automatic transmission fluid. It's got great properties for, in, for impregnating into the steel of the bandsaw blade and preserving that blade. A little oil coating on this wheel keeps it from rusting. Rust is things that break down metal and we don't want this wheel rusting. So I always keep the wheel oiled. And, and this is a drip system. You can't see it from where you're at, but it's got a filter 
a, a valve and then a drip to, uh, a dripper that's the old timey sight glass window drip I mean it's got the window and you can see the drop form and it drops down and and so it comes down and we usually use about one drop a second now this is on the exit side this does two things it is a blocker it is blocking the spray of sawdust that is happening over here and go in between this wheel this blocks it so it stops that plus we can lubricate the blade there if we want to we have another one on this side I'm gonna walk around we have another dripper that is here and and it gets oil or, or diesel fuel a solvent uh, oil base onto the blade and it enters the log so if you if you prevent heat then you don't have to eliminate it by cooling it so our drip system is to eliminate friction, not to cool it after it gets hot. The other thing you'll see here is we have our, we call it debarker blade, mud saw, whatever you want. It swings in with hydraulic pressure, hydraulic motor here, and it spins this blade. And what it does is it cuts a path in through the bark, in through the mud, right where that saw blade is going to go. And so this saw blade is coming into the cut right in this area right here. And so it goes through clean, it comes out clean. Your blade is preserved from, from getting all that mud on it and eating those teeth off. It don't take much mud to eat the teeth off of blades. So the debarker can be a very handy tool. It's not an absolute must that you have a debarker. It's more important to have a sharpener and a setter and, and a band roller so that you can maintain the blade. But secondary to that, I'd then have the mud saw because it keeps that mud out of your way. One of the things you'll notice probably from this angle is we have the chains here. We've got two chains in the front. We have two chains in the back. They're in unison. They let this head down uniformly and pick it up uniformly. You'll notice these chrome rods. They ride on a bushing on both sides. They ride on a bushing and it slides up and down. That keeps this head going up and down uniform. It's not letting it sway side to side. It's not letting it move side to side this way. It is very stable. A bandsaw blade that, that we want to cut, we want it to be stable. One other thing that I'll bring to your attention while we're right here is, you'll notice when we cut the log, we saw the slab off the top, and we rotate that log this direction. Now we're entering at least for, the, for a part of the time we can enter the clean cut. Part of the round part of the log will enter the dirty side, that's where the mud saw comes in, it cuts that off. But as soon as we get down just a little bit into it, we're entering this clean face. If I can enter that clean face, my blade's gonna stay sharp for a longer period of time. Now, this is very important. Some of the mills have this side over here. They have a cantilevered head over here. They're painted orange, if you, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's cantilevered, and this is the most unstable side of the mill. Then, then they have the, actually the log clamps up over here on, on that particular mill, and, and this side is kind of unstable. Well, what we do is the opposite. This is the most stable side of the mill. This is a rigid guide system. And so I'm going to enter that log on the most stable side of the mill. Now the reason I'll call this one the unstable side, if there is an unstable side on this mill, is because this movable guide, it slides in and out. This is not as stable. I can wiggle it a little bit. I can push hard enough. It has to have enough tolerance so that it can slide in and out. But I'm entering it very stable. It's very easy to, to accept it coming off from this side on what I'll refer to as the, the most unstable side. So I'm saying this is the most stable, that's the most unstable, and this is where we want to enter it. And notice the other thing, the log will be right here. We're coming out from this real stable side and it comes into the log there. We are not going to move this head by shaking on it. So when you're looking at a sawmill, you get over there and see if you can shake that thing. If you can shake it, it's gonna bounce when it's trying to saw lumber. A blade that's not stable is not sawing as good as one that is stable. And that's just the fact of the matter. From this angle, we can look up and see that we have a hydraulic motor with a gearbox that is lifting these chains that lifts our head up and down uniform. And when we get around and start sawing, we're gonna focus on the fact that I can saw without a computer I can saw accurately. I can stop right on the number that I want to stop on 
And we can do that because of the way we have our hydraulics set up. I've got a fast and slow speed on the up and the down, and I can go right to the number I want with my hand control box. We also have the computer that you can put on board. It makes things just a little bit faster. Some people really like the computer. In this world today, some people hate a computer. We've got you covered either way. This mill don't need a computer to run. A computer will make it just a hair faster, not much faster. I've actually had people watch me saw and they couldn't believe that there wasn't a computer on there. And I'm not even sawing every day. People who saw every day, they can outperform what I can do. But it's easy to saw, it's very uh, user friendly when it comes to setting the thickness of the board by sight. <laughs> On this side of the, the saw head, as we call it, I wanna show you the tensioning device. A tensioning device is a very, very important part of a bandsaw blade. Here's why it is. The bandsaw steel is spring steel. All of the blades that are made, it doesn't matter who the manufacturer is, it is some type of spring steel. That means when you hit the wood, it stretches, and when you come out of the wood, it wants to come back. The blades that have been made all the way back to the early 1800s did exactly this. It is the same thing today, whether that blade is 12 inches wide or whether that blade is one inch wide. It expands and stretches when the horsepower is delivered to the blade and the blade is pulled through the cut doing its job. And the more horsepower you put in, the harder it's stretched. And so as this blade stretches, we've got to give it back. And that's very important. Now, if you have a, a rigid system that doesn't give it back, then that's what I call a dead tensioner. It's not alive, it's dead. So you have to jack all the stretch out of the blade and you hold it there and that's the only way to saw. This tensioner here stretches and gives it back. That extends the life of the blade because we're not having to stretch that blade, all of the stretch out of it. And, and I wanna show you why that does that. If you can look in this area, if he's zooming in, right here is a hinge point. This hinge point allows this to swing out and back in, out and in. Then we have a spring right here that is loaded to the right amount of tension for that blade. And as I, as you'll notice, I'll jack this hydraulic, this is basically a hydraulic jack laying on its side. It's a, a high quality jack that will allow that. And as I jack this out, you can see this start to move. It's gonna be hard because it's not moving much. And once it reaches a tight spot, then I'm putting my tension by compression of this spring. And I've got a lined up marker here that I can bring it exactly there. You may see this tool hanging here. This tool goes in, in between the spring gaps and I can tell if I've got the right compression. Th this tool thickness is the right amount of gap that I want in the spring. With this system, I can run a blade that's, that, that's an inch short to an inch long, and it won't matter. I'll get the same amount of tension when I compress the spring, the same amount. But this hinge point allows that thing to open and close, open and close, and it's at free. In other words, it's free to do that. It's what I call live tension that it can give and take at will whenever it needs to. I think that's very, very important. Now we also have a hinge point that runs vertical. We have two bolts in this area that allows us to, I call it open like a book. If we allow that to open, then what it does with our bearing system mounted here, it allows the tracking to change. So this is how we track. If I open it out this way, the blade tracks toward the log. If I close the book, the blade tracks back toward the operator or back toward the back side of the blade. And so it's very easy and it's very precise that we can track it. We have this system on the idle side. We have the exact system on the drive side. There's no tension on the drive side. We have a drive bearing assembly that's got tapered roller bearings. It's a very strong assembly, but it has the same uh, tracking device on there. So this is very important. I mentioned it while we we're on the front side. It's very important to get the top of your, your blade, I'm sorry, the band wheel from top to bottom, that's vertically. It's very important to get that aligned correctly. When we get that aligned correctly so that it agrees with our guides and the flatness of our blade, those three things go hand in hand. When those three, three things agree, that blade will saw straight through the hardest knots that you've ever seen. Some of you have seen mills that come along to a knot and it rises up and settles back down. That is, a, that is a tensioning system that's not right. It may be band wheels that's not right. 
and it, it is a alignment on that meal that is not right. There are meals out there that do not have vertical alignment on them. And when they don't have vertical alignment, if you want to saw straight lumber, you better steer clear of those meals because you're going to have problems with them. We use the Perkins engine. That Perkins engine has just been fabulous for us. Same type engine as you have in the old Massey Ferguson tractors and I think even some of the Caterpillar uh, tractors that are made are made with the same, same industrial engine. But um, this setup, easy to maintain. It is easy to adjust. You'll notice our frame is nice and heavy. We have a nice heavy two by four frame in here. Uh, it's stable on the bottom. Uh, all the way across this mill, it's stable. Very important. I want to show you the magnetic scales. The reason we call them magnetic scales is because we have them on a magnetic strip. I can, I can take this and pop this one off, put another one on, just magnetize it like that. We haul that up and down the road with that magnet and never comes off. I even sometimes put a spare one over here on the side of the frame. This one also moves and I can adjust the magnet scale up and down. I can, I can take it and loosen it and slide it up to get my alignment correct. We also have a pointer here that is a stiff wire and we want a fine line pointer so that we can uh, get a fine adjustment and see what we're doing. This is adjustable with slots there as well. You probably can see as he zooms in. This is a very accurate system. It's very uniform. Now, this, this scale is the one inch scale. This one is the four quarter, five quarter, and six quarter. That's what we usually send out as standard. But we have other scales. We have cross tie scales so that it starts at uh, uh, a, 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 a nine inch. It'll start there and travel. Start at a seven inch, start at a six inch and an eight inch. So you can, you can have your cross tie scale involved with this and it will have the full quarter uh, lumber scale on the cross tie. So some people saw cross ties with these mills and sight saw and the scales make it real easy to sight saw on, on the cross ties. On this portion of the sawmill, I'll start with the wheels. We've, we've got heavy duty axles. Um, these, these axles are easy to carry the weight of this sawmill. Both axles are electric brakes. We want to have a good stopping power. This is a heavy mill, so we want to have that extra braking to stop this mill when it's going forward. Three quarter ton truck will pull it, even if it didn't have brakes, but that makes it much safer to have both axles with electric brakes. We notice the next thing is our log loader. This is a heavy built log loader. We've had a lot of people say, I've never seen a log that it wouldn't load. I'm certain you can finally find one, but, but it'll, take, uh, it'll take a 30 inch log, 16 to 20 foot long and load it up. I've loaded logs that, that were massive with this thing and it never even stalls out. It'll just load it right up. We have little catches here that some people choose to cut off after later. But we have that so that when it's down on the ground level, you roll the log in, it don't roll back. But uh, I like to put a six by six down and put it inside of here on both sides and I put my logs and it'll just roll right in. And then that keeps a little stop that, that keeps that log rolling forward always. All logs are not smooth, round and, and straight. So you need a little help sometimes. We make a real strong fender so you can put pressure on it. You can bang it around a little bit. Uh, it's, it's a nice fender. We have the uh, sandpaper anti-slip right here because you're always going to step up here and do things to the head. So we don't want you slipping on that. This is a very strong log turner. If you'll notice, the, the side plates are made out of half inch steel. We've got a nice big 120 roller chain. We've got steel blocks with bushings inside of them. Uh, a lot of people are putting pillow block bearings down here on the log turners. Pillow block bearings will crack, they will break, and when one of them breaks, you're down disassembling this whole system. With our bearings made out of solid steel with bushings pressed into them, fitting the inch and a half shaft that's there, you won't break those bearings. I've never seen one of those broke. Takes a long time of wear to wear the bushings down to where you have to do a repair on this. So it gives very good service, it's very stout. I've seen these log turners made out of very lightweight steel, you know, in the eighth to a quarter inch category, and they will bend in this area because what happens, you get a big log that's swell butted on one end, and you think you well, you have to kind of center it to load it up, and then you, you, you lift it up and it slides and it'll bend that, that log turner. We went with half inch plate. I've never seen that get bent since we've gone to half inch plate. 
and, uh, and that's the last thing I want to do. And that's what takes more torture than anything else on this mill is the log turner. And that's why we have the big heavy chain, we have the big stoutness and, and the nice strong bearings. This is what we call our log dog or log clamp. Some people refer to them as, you'll notice we have two of them. This will go up and down. It will stop anywhere that you want to. We use a hydraulic manual lever to adjust that up and down. It's on a joystick control we'll show you later. It is a hydraulic motor that moves it up and down. They move up and down in unison. They will, they will go up and down together. Then we have a hydraulic cylinder on a scissor clamp that runs our slide across the clamp. Now what this does is it, 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 they don't work in unison together. One can outrun the other. Actually the one that has the least amount of resistance will slide first. But it, let's just say this is a bail end, it'll clamp here and then that's a little end. That one will come on in and clamp it there. That's why they're not tied up in exact unison because I want it to fit that log no matter what shape the log is. And so these log clamps do very well. Now in conjunction with the log clamps, of course you can see here we've got the stainless steel beds uh, that, that gives you a wear strip. It keeps from staining your lumber with iron stain. Iron stain is not a degrade, but sometimes uh, lumber buyers will do that to people and they shouldn't do it, but they do it some anyway. And on this side we have what we call a bird beak just because it's pointed like a bird's beak. And when that cant is here and you clamp it in, it will spike onto this bird beak and that holds that cant down so that it can't rise up and bow. Because one of the things that happens when you got a square timber is as you're sawing, it wants to bow up in the center and it'll start giving you thick and thin lumber. But if it's clamped properly and holding it properly, it'll give you the same thickness of lumber from the top to the bottom. Then we have squaring arms. These squaring arms are made uh, out of strong steel. They are in unison. One lever will make both of these work. And uh, they're adjustable so that we can get square. We want to be square with this bunk. And if we get that face up here square, that log turner is easy to make it square up with the face of this, then we get a square timber every time. One of the things I'll make note of is Sometimes in production sawing, people are sawing maybe an extra long cross tie, just sometimes they want a second log turner, maybe they got big timbers. We can put another log turner down in this area, anywhere we want to along. I have put as many as three in one long, it was a 40 foot sawmill, we put three log turners in to turn the bigger logs. It makes things a lot faster and more uniform. But even if you were trying to get high production, sometimes that second log turner pays off in the benefits. Also, we can put more of these squaring arms. We can put what we call a short squaring arm in here and, and that will keep the short logs or if you saw a lot of eight foot, I recommend putting the short squaring arm just so you don't have to hunt and keep that log exactly in the right place. But outside of that, these do a good job. But if you had an extra long mill, then you put more squaring arms down there. One cylinder operates all the squaring arms at this point the energy chain that we use to, is a carrier for the hydraulic lines for the electrical lines that go in and control the electric valves. If it were a uh, AC mill with, uh, with an electric motor, three phase motor, then this is the carrier that would carry the electricity up to the motor. But it carries that hydraulic power back down to the, to the lower bed and does a good job with that. Alright, I want to show you the manual hydraulic that we use to turn the log, handle the log. We try to make things work in a flow, and in this case it starts on the right side, which is where I'm gonna load the log is on the right side. So my log lift is the first thing. Now I've got this motor idle down so you can hear it, and this is on the slow side. You'll see that speed up when we rev the engine up and go ahead to a sawing speed. But as I hold that up, my log is loaded, and I push down, then the log clamp comes down. That's real easy and real simple. My squaring arms, they come up, they go down. This is my log turner next and they come up. I can turn the log up. I can push my chain down. Now the chain coming down is not for turning the log down but is for scooting that log in to make sure it squares up against my squaring arm. So I've got control of that with the joystick and I can do that with one hand. Then my clamps come up and across. If you notice everything flows in the direction. So if I push it to the right, they go to the right, I push it to the left, they go to the left. If I pull it to me, they go down, I push it, they go up. So simple. The, the tapers 
up is up, down is down. And so that works out real nice. So all of these things are made for the simplicity of the operation. All right, here is the hand control box. Now you'll notice I've got a place I can put this hand control box here and it stays. I've got a place that I can put this box over here if I'm on, uh, if, and I can walk from back and forth. I've got plenty of cord to do that. I kind of like holding it. And a lot of people get used to it and just leave it in one place and operate it from there. Now I want to zoom in on it and show you some of the functions. The first thing is power. We have to have power on to make this, this whole box light up. There's the fuse. This is my fast and slow for the up and down. I have that on my right hand so that I can flip that up and down at will. Then I move to the left side with my left thumb. That's up, that's down. You can see that head going down as I hold it. That's up. If I switch it to slow, then it slows down. If I switch it to fast, it takes off fast. While I hold it down, I can switch that. Forward and reverse. This is reverse. That's forward. Throttle to throttle it up. Throttle back down. If I want to kill it, I have a kill switch that I can press and kill it. My guide goes out, my guide goes in, and this is my, my debarker blade engaging when I pull it to end. When I push it out, the debarker blade comes back out. Very simple to operate, very simple to use. I wanna show you the lining of our bed there so that the lumber, as we drag it back, if you'll think about it, the log is up here this high where we're sawing. The board comes back, it wants to kind of take a nose dive. It might dive in here, it's cording to the length. It might dive in here, it'll slide right across and just slide right on out the end. On the end, we have a dead roller so that when it hits here, you can take a pretty big heavy timber and, and balance the weight on that roller and it'll just slide right back into your stack or uh, onto a forklift, however you have that set up to uh, receive that lumber. But this is important for the drag back. The drag back is a very good feature and I haven't shown you that on the mill, but I'll, I'm gonna carry and show you the drag back fingers and the function that they do. Uh, the drag back saves a lot of time. It makes this mill truly a one man operation. I can saw a lot of lumber right by myself. However, I can't bring this mill to its full potential by myself but I can saw by myself. If I add one man, I can bring it to a higher level. If I add two men, that I can carry this thing on up to a higher level. I sometimes make the comment, I can kill two people back here with, a, with the speed that this thing will saw. If I've got a good flow of logs coming in, I can put a flow of lumber coming out the back. Somebody better be ready to catch some lumber the way this thing kicks the lumber out. But I'll carry to the, to the uh, drag back fingers and show you the importance of them. The drag back fingers are up inside of here. They can swing forward, drop down over. We raise the head up anywhere from three quarters to an inch. The fingers will catch the board, slide the board back out. You notice this little odd shape on this. And what that is, is when the board tries to kick up because the weight of it, when it comes off the end of the log, it wants to kick up. This stops it from kicking up and it'll, it'll just slide right on out the back end, just making the drag back work much more easily and freely. Now, when we're sawing with these drag back fingers, I don't like to slam them because this head moves fast. When things move fast, you have to be cautious about how you do it. So I bump that head. You'll notice when I'm sawing, I'll bump the head back and when I pick the board up, then I press the button, hold it down and it'll slide back out very rapidly. I just don't want to slam it. If you slam things long enough, you can tear something up. But, uh, but that's the function of the drag back fingers. <laughs>